Welcome to Coming from Left Field, where we have conversations about politics, books, and current events with your host, Greg Gottles and Pat Cummings. There once was a country where citizens read more books and saw more films than any other place in the world. Every year, the number of people visiting museums equaled nearly half the entire population, and attendance at theaters, concerts, and other performances surpassed the total population. The government made a concerted effort to raise literacy, and nearly everyone could read and write. Free college, health care, inexpensive housing. Before 1991, it was the fastest-growing developed country in the world. And then came Mikhail Gorbachev, and the Berlin Wall was torn down. Let's discuss. Warm greetings. We're here together with uh, Roger Karen and Thomas Kinney, or Joe Jameson. I don't know which of the two, uh, right under the name Thomas Kinney. Mm -hmm. And I am really looking forward to this conversation. It is... Uh, I think we could say, uh, Greg, without a doubt, we've got two of the experts on the subject of the fall of the Soviet Union with us today, who literally wrote the book, the first book, almost 20 years ago, uh, outlining this. And with the death of Gorbachev, uh, this is going to be an exciting conversation. So Roger is a historian, a professor, has taught at Cornell, Princeton, Rutgers, New York State. Uh, Joe is retired labor economist uh, and a member of the U.S. Peace Council and also very involved with uh, Marxist-Leninist Today, which is a, a very good journal uh, re regarding uh, contemporary socialism and Marxist and Leninism. So glad to have you here. Glad to be here. Good, good. Yes, thank you. Well, uh, we're here to do a couple of things, but one of the things one of the things I wanted to do is to talk about your book, Socialism Betrayed: Behind the Collapse of the Soviet Union. And like I said, this was written almost two decades ago, uh, and it deals with why did everything fall apart with the uh, with the death of Gorbachev? This is going to be a, a both um, a good time to reflect back on really what happened. So tell us a little bit about your your book, uh, the uh, socialism betrayed. Well, uh, let me uh, um, shift things just a little bit and come back to your to your question uh, that. Uh, I mean, I can't help but starting with what's uh, on my mind, which is, uh, it seems to me that the most important thing that we face today, all of us in the world, really, but uh, particularly on the left, is uh, what's going on in the Ukraine. That this represents a shifting balance of forces, a uh, new balance of forces, since uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union, and that we, at this moment, we're in a more dangerous and uncertain world than we've known since World War II. Those are not just my words, those are, happens to be the words of uh, Xi Jinping at the 20th Congress of the Chinese Communist Party also. But it's also uh, reflected uh, widely uh, that, for example, that we've never been so close to nuclear conflict since 60 years ago, or 70 or whatever, the 1962, since the Cuban Missile Crisis, that uh, according to some experts, the threat of nuclear war today is about what it was then. Kennedy said the threat of nuclear war in 1962 was one out of three. That's what uh, some people are saying today. So this is a very dangerous situation. And it's and I'm also struck by the fact that the, there's not uh, the kind of reaction you'd expect to see in this country politically on the left uh, that uh, the situation calls for. Why is that? Well, part of it, of course, is the defection of the Social Democrats. Typically, <laughs> Bernie and uh, AOC and all of them have voted for the war. And uh, recently, uh, you know, if you followed the paper the last couple of days, 30 people uh, Congressmen have objected, but they immediately withdrew their objection. So part of it is the desertion of the Social Democrats, but part of it, I think, also is the communist left, the left socialist left, have not appreciated 
the connection between this war and the collapse of the Soviet Union. And I think if we understood that better, we'd understood the, better the perilous uh, situation that we're in. So uh, let me just uh, summarize very quickly what, what I mean by that, then we can go back to, you, to, the, to the book and your questions. But I think what uh, the current situation underscores is two things. One, a greater appreciation of what the Soviet Union represented. Uh, I mean that it that is if the Soviet Union still existed, obviously there would not be a war in the Ukraine. The Soviet Union brought together 15 different nations, including including the Ukraine, who for 70 years existed peacefully with each other in cooperation, and now we have war. But not only that, that the Soviet Union brought a more peaceful world by thwarting or constraining American imperialism, namely by creating a military balance or parity, more or less, between the US and the Soviet Union. So that uh, the Soviet Union was put forth the idea of peaceful coexistence and the US had to more or less accept this with the doctrine of containment. That is, the US imperialism decided they would not try to roll back socialism in the Soviet Union, but just contain it. So this led to a more or less peaceful world until the collapse of the Soviet Union. Now with the collapse of the Soviet Union, what you have is an emboldened US imperialism. And uh, uh, after Gorbachev died, as Pat said, you know, there are all kinds of uh, accolades and eulogies about what uh, Gorbachev represented, that he brought the end to the Cold War, a more peaceful world. That is complete horse pucky, you know. <laughs> Obviously, this is a more dangerous world that we live in than we lived in before the collapse of the Soviet Union, a, a much more dangerous world. And um, that uh, uh, I, I think that, let's see, where was I going to go with that? Sorry. But um, uh, anyway, anyway, that. Um, I think that this is what's not been appreciated is how the US imperialism has been emboldened by the collapse of the Soviet Union. And it's been the expansion uh, and, and, and this expansion is represented by this throwing out really of the containment policy and the expansion of NATO since the collapse of the Soviet Union. Now some 15, 12 or 15 countries who were formerly part of the Soviet Union, the Warsaw Pact are now part of NATO. And NATO continues to expand, or want to expand by including uh, the Ukraine. Uh, th this aggressiveness is also reflected in the last week's uh, national security strategy, which says China is our main enemy, our main competitor. This is a much more aggressive position towards uh, China. And it's also re reflected in this new Biden ideology that uh, justifies our expansionism under the idea that this is democracy versus authoritarianism in the world. This is the new ideology. So uh, uh, this is the, my bottom line, that, that we have to appreciate how the collapse of the Soviet Union has made this a much more dangerous world, how it's emboldened US imperialism. And that uh, this, I think this is one of the crucial things for the left to understand today to mobilize a peace sentiment against this war. Now we can circle back to uh, the book if you want. <laughs> well, that back to your book, the, the narratives that I have been sold that I am familiar with about the Soviet Union, about, um, you know, Lenin, about World War II, about the Soviets' influence and in trying to keep, as you said, imperialism under check. Are it, it it's like I'm it's like I'm reading two completely different stories when I'm reading your book and when then what I what I came to this through my limited um, understanding of of of, of history, um, and I think I that's what we're hearing hear right now. We're pers we're 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 personalizing this that there's this bad guy, Putin, who's trying to expand his influence and he's just a he's a rascal. And we need to stop him, and that's as simple as that. And we don't stop. We don't go back and look at it any further with more depth than that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, if it's like telling the civil is telling the Second World War, we won the Second World War and we defeated Hitler. Well, eighty to ninety percent of all of the Germans were killed by the Soviet Union, and I'm sorry, it probably was the Soviet Union that <laughs> defeated Hitler. 
not yeah. the United States. We kind of came in late, you know. But we have us. We have a a, a a narrative being told uh, that's incorrect, and I think that's kind of the frustrating thing that is you two as historians must just drive you crazy how you're seeing the popular press portray these situations as opposed to the uh what the foundational understanding of it is i don't, I don't know what do you think joe is that well we wrote the book uh because there was no book uh mm -hmm. the, uh in the immediate after 1991 uh we expected there would be an outpouring of uh, writing, especially among Marxists and communists and people who were supporters of the Soviet Union. And there was a, a kind of a silence. Uh, and that lasted for a number of years. And finally, by our, uh, after discussions among our, between ourselves, we, we got around to uh, undertaking it and uh, uh, to come up with an explanation that would address the questions and, and the dominant the dominant narrative. The dominant narrative is, is what you said, Pat. It, it's uh, 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 it's very much um, one that uh, just is based on the notion that the Soviet Union was over over centralized and uh, undemocratic, and uh, uh, and uh, Gorbachev came along and tried to democratize it, and somehow he blundered. And it all came apart, and it's it's about as simple as that. Um, we we made some discoveries in the course of our work. Uh, one of them was that uh, so the Soviet communist politics was by no means homogeneous. There were really were two basic trends, uh, and this goes back to the class structure of the Soviet Union. There were there were two trends. There was one that was. Uh, Marxist and, and uh, based on the working class uh, and uh, supported public ownership and leadership of the party and so forth. And then there was a, a, a another trend was essentially social democratic. And these two trends existed throughout the 72 years of Soviet history. In fact, they existed back before the revolution, um, Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks, was, uh, there, was that, there was that dichotomy. That dichotomy existed all throughout Soviet politics. And with Gorbachev, the, the right-wing trend, the petty bourgeois trend, if you will, came to power. The other discovery uh, and carried out a far more radical policy than it had ever before. It had had some influence with Bukharin in the 1920s. It had had some influence with Khrushchev in the 50s and 60s, but it came to power in a far more radical way uh, with Gorbachev in 1985. The other discovery we made uh, is that uh, there, while the, the dominant economy in the Soviet Union was planned, publicly owned, uh, there was another economy, uh, a, a private illegal, illegal economy, which uh, had been uh, kept under strict control in the early years of the Soviet Union. But after 1953, it was allowed to grow and it became the material basis. Uh, and, and the irony is Marxist scholars missed this altogether. It was, it was bourgeois scholars who identified this, uh, this second economy, or if you will, underground economy or black market economy. And uh, Gorbachev unleashed that with his policies after 1987. So these were the two essential insights uh, that our book had and brought them together. Let me go through some of my observations and then respond to these. One is the popular belief is, the, is, is that this was, this, this was tried, this, this planned economy was tried. It didn't really work. Gorbachev inherited this and he did the best thing he could by trying to break it up and uh, and you know peacefully dissolve the Soviet Union. It your book says no. It was oh, sh there were problems. There are obviously problems with the Soviet Union. You describe these problems very very clearly. Parenti in his book describes them very very clearly. Uh, Carlos uh, uh, Martinez describes them in his book very very clearly. It could have been corrected 
But when Gorbachev got, came in, his policies were the policies that literally destroyed the Soviet Union, that, that, that brought the Soviet Union down. Either intentionally or unintentionally, there could have been corrections made to correct the difficulties the Soviet Union was going through. Is that, is that correct? That's a fair, that's a fair, I'll let Roger answer as well, but that's a fair summary. The Soviet Union grew faster than the United States over its whole history up until 1988, I guess. And uh, even when a certain slowdown took place and we explained the slowdown and its causes uh, in the 1970s and 80s, it was still growing faster than the United States. So, it, by the by, the time Gorbachev arrived in power, uh, the Soviet Union was enjoying the highest standard of living it had ever ever enjoyed, and and the people liked and the people liked it. I mean, yes. generally speaking, if you were to poll the 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 people that were under this this situation, they were by and large happy right. with. They knew where their problems were. They knew there were difficulties, but the discontent arose after Gorbachev's policies in 1987. Uh, started dismantling, uh, enfeebling the party, dismantling the planned publicly owned economy, surrendering to U.S. imperialism. Um, there, are, there are four or five central policies that he undertook consciously after 1987, which involved a dismantling of the system. Uh, and that's when the discontent really arose, not, not before. The initial his initial reform course course sorry course uh, was that of Andropov, his one of his predecessors, which could have had promising results if he had stayed on it. But he's the pressures from uh, the uh, the corruption in the party and the uh, the second economy pushed him in the other direction. Let me just intervene for a second and say, Joe's a little too modest on the origins of uh, our book. It was uh, Joe who came up with this idea that we, what we was really needed was a book on the collapse of the Soviet Union because the commonsensical understanding was getting us nowhere. And again, I think Pat did a, a good job summarizing that. that. It was kind of a, if the Soviet Union was so successful, how come it failed? You know, <laughs> something. So I think that, that uh, uh, that's where we began. That first of all, that it was successful. That is, for the most part, there were problems, but it was successful. That in 1985, when Gorbachev came to power, the Soviet Union was not in a, a crisis. There was no none of the earmarks of a society in crisis: unemployment, inflation, strikes, demonstrations. None of that uh, existed, as, as Pat said. The, uh, the Polls at the time, American polls, uh, Amer Soviet people were as content with their system as Americans were with theirs. Uh, so, uh, but there were uh, there were problems, and uh, as there are problems in China, as there are problems in all societies, but uh, there were some particular chronic problems in the Soviet Union. Uh, the uh, People wanted better quantity, more quantities of goods. They wanted better quality of goods. Uh, there was the uh, the strain put on the Soviet Union by uh, the new Cold War started by Jimmy Carter that meant the diversion of billions of dollars into the military. There was the development of this black market and with the black market came corruption. So there, there were problems. But I think the important thing to underscore is that when Gorbachev and drop off before him and Gorbachev came to power, it was to address these problems. It was not to uh, overthrow socialism. You did not have a, an uprising against socialism in 1985. The whole idea was we're gonna keep what we have, keep our free health care, keep our free education, keep our low rents, keep our low food prices, uh, keep our early retirement, keep our pensions. We're gonna keep this all, but we're going to get some of the quality goods that uh, that they have in the West. I think that this was this was the idea. Gorbachev did not represent an uprising against socialism. It was the idea he was going to improve socialism. But of course, the, the medicine is what killed the system because right. this medicine attacked the fundamental bases of the, the socialist system, namely the Communist Party and the uh, centralized planned economy. So 
here's another thing I learned from your book. I, I hope I'm not talking too much. Greg, no. jump in if, if you if you want, because I um, you you talked about glasnost and perestroika and how Gorbachev gets credit for this. Well, actually, it was Andropov, the, the fellow before who was there for just a short period of time, a brilliant guy, workaholic, strong believer in Marxist theory. And his idea was that Glasnost should be have a more open government, more communicative. We should have a better system of disseminating information. And what Gorbachev did is he ended up taking those principles, which which were our good principles, and probably would have really helped a lot had that happened. He ended up taking his cue from that that he ended up being more uh, um, a negative towards the Communist Party and more controlling of information. In other words, he took what was essentially a good theory and his implementation was just the opposite of what was the spirit of Glasnost and it also contributed to the problem of, uh, of the demise of the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. and, and yet it's in the New York Times headline when he died uh, here's the headline, adopting principles of glasnost and perestroika, he weighed the legacy of seven de decades of communist rule and set a new course uh, presiding over the end of the Cold War and the dissolution of the USSR. That's what he's credited for. Well, mm -hmm. he, he kind of screwed things up <laughs> and, and didn't, didn't do things the way he could have done to have what was a pretty good system continue is that is that reasonable yeah i think so and uh you know i mean what what everybody uh, forgets uh after gorbachev's death amidst all of these eulogies and headlines in the new york times is that there was no person more hated and more reviled and more detested in uh russia uh, <laughs> when he died than gorbachev himself in 1996 uh, after he had uh, undermined socialism, uh, unemployment had taken off, uh, the uh, kleptocrats had taken control of much of the industry that uh, Soviet workers had built, etc. Uh, the uh, life expectancy fell to what it was under the czars. So at that point, 1996, Gorbachev ran for president. He got 0.5% of the vote. The communist Zuganov Ram got 33% of the vote and uh, Yeltsin got 35%, something like that. Whenever he campaigned throughout the Soviet Union, he was met with hostile crowds who reviled him. <laughs> this, this didn't make it into Gorbachev's uh, obituaries. In the New York right. Times. Uh, it's telling that uh, opinion polls after 1991 showed uh, strong support for the Soviet Union as capitalism was being uh, shoved down the throats of the people. In spite of that, and in fact, maybe because of that, the uh, support for the Soviet Union and, and the expression of missing it, the expression of wishing it had not been dissolved was very, very strong. In fact, it was a dominant uh, thinking. It dissipated with time because young people didn't know it. I mean, as younger people um, grew up in Russia, they didn't know what they were missing. But among the folks that lived uh, in so the Soviet world, these are these are Western Poles for the for the most part. So there's no disputing them, but it it really dispels this notion that that uh, communism was an alien system foisted upon the Russian people. Blah blah blah. The, all the all the kind of mythology that we grew up with uh, living in this country that uh, is is it was just uh, false. Uh, it's so one of the tragedies is that the tragedy of time and place. That is that uh, the information technological revolution that came around that time and, and, and broadened and deepened afterwards could have really, really made the planning system function uh, beautifully. I mean, all, all the things that we know about technology today, the, the, small, the computers, the ability to gather information and data, it's used here repressively, but it could have been used in a planned economic uh, uh, system to enrich the, the, the amount of uh, goods that people wanted and allow people to plan for it with less waste. It could have been a solution to the environmental problem in terms of it would be an anti-consumerism 
kind of planning that was based upon people being able to indicate what they really wanted instantaneously. And of course, there was the, uh, the aggression, which is never mentioned whenever people talk about the mistakes, the quote, mistakes that were made by the uh, Soviet Union. No one ever talks about the aggression that the U.S. mounted against it, the attempts to destroy it. Reagan's plan for uh, um, uh, escalating the Cold War, uh, escalating it enormously with uh, billions of dollars. That had to be met on the Soviet part. Uh, the Soviets' uh, vast, vast energy uh, resources were, were then entering the international market more and more because because of peaceful coexistence, and they were undermined by, by price reductions that were dramatic in that period and hurt them dramatically in terms of their trade and their planning. So that has to be mentioned as well. And it's all, I mean, I, I'm a great admirer of the book that Roger and, and, and Joe put together. Uh, after I read it, uh, for me, it was case closed. I mean, I, I had then the material to understand what happened and understand it much, much better. Uh, yeah, another, another example of what uh, Greg's referring to in terms of the uh, uh, aggressive war that U.S. imperialism raged, uh, waged against the Soviet Union was uh, Afghanistan. That's, a, that's like the perfect example uh, that uh, in the 1970s, a popular government came to, to power in Afghanistan and uh, raised the standard of living, uh, started educating women, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. And uh, the U.S. started to support the uh, the Taliban, the the Mujahideen. Uh, eventually, uh, by 1979, 1980, the, the largest CIA operation in history was taking place in Afghanistan, and uh, the Soviet Union intervened militarily to support that democratic government. But uh, it's very interesting that Brzezinski, who was the national security advisor to Carter, said we sucked the Soviet Union into Afghanistan. <laughs> we sucked the Soviet Union in. They, what, they were provoking the Soviet Union to intervene and uh, in, in hopes of disrupting the system. Uh, frankly, it's the same playbook that the US is using right now in, in Ukraine against a, a non-socialist government against Russia. Suck Russia into this conflict with the idea that it can bring regime change and they can get rid of Putin. And and they did. They 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 were successful. They the CIA went all over Pakistan, all over these countries, with paying people to come in to be the the quote freedom fighters as uh, as Reagan might have called them. Um, and I, I when I read the Afghan paper right after the collapse, I read the Afghan paper. It's just it's just absolutely clear our our manipulation of that situation and how the Soviets never had any intention of kind of invading this country. They wanted to come in and try to reestablish this government that was being destabilized by our actions, by the CIA's actions. Exactly. Yeah. I, you know, you could, you can, you can, well, don't get me going. Oh, let, let me explain let me say one thing. When I start my uh, podcast, I always have a little, you know, narrative, a little, you know, sound bite. And my narrative this time was uh, there once was a country where citizens read more books and saw more films than any other place in the world. Nearly every year, the number of people visiting museums equaled half the entire population and attendance in theaters, concerts, and other performances surpassed the total population. By the way, that's direct quotes from your book. Uh, government made a concerted effort to raise literacy. Nearly everyone could read and write, free college, healthcare, and expensive housing. When we go to theaters and when I go to Benny Roll Hall, it's very wealthy, wealthy people there. The Soviet Union brought this the age of enlightenment and they, 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 it was common for the working person to have a library. It was common for the working person to go to, to the ballet alongside everybody else. That was part of the intellectual supercharging that created this remarkable growth that put people to the space before anyone else that created the 
the the crane which is used in modern high rise productions that um you know their 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 level of uh, education and literacy and science and so forth was created by this egalitarian social supercharging of the academia enlightenment intellectual and it wasn't just soviet plays it was shakespeare it was all of these other things i think that's one thing that we don't we don't think about when we think about the soviet union of how powerful that was in influencing all of the changes that they ultimately came from that intellectual capital uh any thoughts on that I, I knew not that that's an amazing yeah, fact that I don't think, one, think about. It, it's necessary to point out they did it so quickly. I mean, they did it in a very short span and under great, great uh, duress during that whole period. I mean, nobody else could do that under the duress that they were, the isolation, the aggression against them. World War II that they, as you said earlier, they won. And uh, yet this was done. A country was brought from virtual illiteracy and almost feudalism, quasi-feudalism, uh, to that level in such a short time. No one else can make that claim. No one. Maybe China, maybe People's China can. Yeah, that was an, that, that was a, a part a part of the whole story I knew nothing knew nothing of. Knew nothing of. That's an amazing and important part. Um, the other thing that I think I'd like to go to China, but I'd like to talk about China from this book. Greg and I are reading the American American Midnight. Mayor, are you familiar with this book? Midnight. Uh, it, it's a book that talks about uh, after 1917, when Lenin came in and, and started his little uh, revolution, uh, it put, uh, it literally freaked out uh, the capitalist, colonialist part of our world. And it, they were they were fearful that it would spread to other parts of the world, and thus we began our you know our Red Scare and, and so forth. Right now we have China, and China has probably bettered the Soviet Union in taking people from great poverty to putting them in modern high rises in just a generation, and. They are unlike uh, Gorbachev. They are not um, rejecting the principles of Marxism and Leninism. They are saying that this is an inextricable part of how we are going to de develop our economy. Uh, the Central Committee in China in 1979, we must keep to the socialist road. Gorbachev didn't do that. We must uphold the uh, dictatorship of the, pol of the proletariat. We must uphold and support the Communist Party. Gorbachev did the opposite of that. And we must old uphold Marxist, Leninist, and Mao Zedong thoughts. In other words, the foundation of those thoughts are important to how they do their economy. And there, that's that's why we get, like you said, Roger, that, that's why we get headlines like this, the national security <laughs> strategy, the U.S. singles out China as the, the sole, our sole global rivalry. Mm -hmm. if, if they can make that work there, and it looks like they're a little more effective in how their planned economy is, is working, um, that's a huge threat. That's a big, big threat. That's the new boogeyman that we always seem to need to be fighting against. Uh, is, is that how you see it? Well, I, I, I'll say I, I spent uh, Monday afternoon reading Xi's uh, report to the 20th Congress of the uh, Communist Party that took place last week. And uh, it seems to me that every section of that report, almost every line of that report was a response to the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh -huh. I mean, he, he doesn't say that directly, but that's, if you read between the lines, that's basically what, what uh, he's saying. We're not going to make the same mistakes that they made in the Soviet Union. We have problems, we have to address them, but we're not going to make the same mistakes. Now, what were the, some of these mistakes according to Z, Xi? Uh, 
Well, the, the most serious one was throwing out ideology. That is throwing out Marxist Leninism. So, so what does that mean? Well, the key element of Marxist Leninism, one of them is uh, the importance of class struggle, the importance of the party. You can't build, you can't make a revolution without a revolutionary party. You can't build socialism without a communist party. So uh, you have to strengthen the communist party, not weaken the communist party as uh, Gorbachev did. And you have to make a consistent effort against ideology. As we point out in our book, what the, uh, the ideology of Bukharanism, of uh, social democracy, this is ultimately where Gorbachev went. And this is what uh, guided his, uh, his corruption of, uh, of socialism. This is the, uh, 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 Xi says that this, we're not gonna make this mistake of throwing out ideology. We're not gonna throw out our history. We're not gonna throw out Lenin. We're not gonna throw out Stalin. We're not gonna throw out Mao. Uh, we can learn from them all. Um, the, to throw it out like Gorbachev did, he said is historical nihilism. And uh, again, they're not going to, Xi says, how do, you, how do you keep from going through this historical cycle of rise and fall, rise and fall? He says, the way you address this is you have to take care of the Communist Party. You have to reform the Communist Party. You have to keep it uh, alert to the needs of the people, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, not weaken the Communist Party, strengthen the Communist Party and strengthen the ideology of the Communist Party, et cetera, et cetera. So I think, again, it's really interesting to read Xi's report with, um, with kind of our analysis of the Soviet Union in mind. I'd like to make just one other re related point on this, and then I, I don't want to dominate this, but you might say that, that one of the lessons of, of our book is the danger of allowing a second economy, a private economy to develop alongside socialism because, well, for all the reasons we, we pointed out. So you might think on first blush, well, the Chinese are ignoring this lesson because they, they're allowing a private economy they're allowing billionaires uh, to develop in China. Isn't this uh, a contradiction of the lesson of the, the Soviet Union? Well, maybe, but not necessarily, because the main problem with the second economy in the Soviet Union was that it was illegal. They allowed a black market to grow and a black market uh, is a, turned out to be a much more dangerous situation because a black market, undermines the socialist economy. It takes, it, it exists only by stealing resources and time from the socialist economy. Plus it puts people against the state because it's illegal and, uh, and it leads to corruption because you can't have an illegal economy exist without corrupting party officials and government officials. So the Chinese are doing this a little differently. They are allowing a private economy, but it's a legal private economy that's limited, uh, uh, restricted, guided, taxed, and kept away from the so-called commanding peaks. Uh, we'll, we'll see if they, if they can manage this. It's a challenge, but it seems to me it would be a mistake to say that the uh, Chinese have not learned the lesson of the second economy from the Soviet Union. They've learned that you can't have a illegal black market economy, that that, that is the most corrosive. If you're going to allow a private economy, it has to be legal, it has to be regulated, it has to be restricted, it has to be taxed. You might say that the Cubans are doing the same thing. They learned the same lesson. Okay, let me stop there. We do know that Cubans have studied our book. Uh, uh, in fact, there's a bit of a story there. Um, the book's been translated into uh, eight languages, uh, French, Russian, Bulgarian, uh, Persian, uh, who am I leaving out? Um, Spanish, uh, um, um, well, anyway, eight languages. And the, uh, the story of the emergence of the Cuban edition was quite interesting. Uh, one of our, our comrades, uh, Walter Tillo, was visiting uh, Ramon Labanino, who was one of the Cuban five in the Ashland Federal Prison in Kentucky. Ramon reads English fluently. Uh, Walter gave him a copy of the book. And at this point, uh, and, and Ramon was impressed by it enough to start dunning the authorities in Cuba, in Havana, the publishing authorities, to uh, 
get the book translated and um, uh, printed in Cuba. Uh, because he, he, Ramon, who is now official, an official in the Cuban government, economic um, side of the Cuban government, uh, felt that perhaps there was a danger that the reform, that the two, uh, the 2010 uh, reforms that the Cubans were making were may, perhaps excessive uh, with respect to allowing the second economy to grow. So uh, when he got out of prison, uh, Raul uh, awarded him a, a job to keep, a, to keep an eye on this very question. And so uh, he, uh, he now, uh, so that we, we do know that the book has been discussed within the Cuban government. And I think Roger's right. We do know that the book has been presented to the uh, uh, Chinese government. Whether a Chinese translation has taken place, we don't know. It's per perhaps a uh, uh, English is well enough known in China that uh, a Chinese translation is not necessary. But uh, it is it is true that the G the Xi speech uh, is obviously concerned about preparing. Uh, you know, there was a there was a famous uh, Marxist scholar who just passed away a year or two ago, named Domenico Losurdo, who said that the uh, the Chinese economy was a, a dramatic and expanded NEP, NEP being the new economic policy when this, for, in the 1920s the Soviets allowed the expansion of capitalist relations of production, and. Uh, uh, I visited China in uh, 2007 uh, and attended a, a conference on the socialist market economy, and there was quite a debate. Uh, there's, there are different tendencies among Chinese economists. Uh, uh, most of them adhere to a kind of a middle position. Uh, some of them felt that uh, too many concessions to capitalism had been made, uh, and there was, were a few on the right who felt that not enough concessions had been made. So uh, there's a lively debate in China, and we're we're hopeful that our book has made a contribution to that debate. But it's it's gotten around. It's uh, we never will make or never did make the New York Times bestseller list, but uh, we did well in Brazil and Portugal and uh, and uh, a number of other countries. And we understand a second Russian edition may be in the works. We've been uh, Roger wrote an introduction to it just a, a month or two ago. Well, I, I ended up sending a, a copy to Greg, and then I bought a copy for myself. And Greg said, "I've had this book for; <laughs> it's been on my shelf forever." So we had to had to pay a couple bucks to mail it back to me. So you got two copies. You know, Ro Roger, to what what you're saying is, I, I'm I'm just learning more about China, and I think that's like where the natural extension of where the, your book goes should be going to trying to understand China, uh, they actually in the last decade have less, uh, you, have, you have public ownership and here in our country, we sell it all off to private people. They end up having more public ownership in the last decades than they did years ago. You know, so they're, they're, it's, it's more, that's again, a, a contradiction in how they're approaching their, their uh, capitalism, if you will, and bringing it into their country. But if you look at the global warming thing, if you, if you I, I'm a big Chomsky fan, his number one thing, he just won't get off it is, you know, if we, we've, this is the number one conflict of our time is to deal with our global warming. We have the Green New Deal, and we're, we talk a lot about it, but we don't do anything about it. I mean, it just, it's a, it's just nothing more than a bumper sticker. In China, they're the number one emitter of CO2. They, but in the last two decades, the last 20 years, they've gone from 80% coal down to 50% coal. And I'm sure it's going to be down to 30% coal in another 10 years. 99% of all the electric buses are China. 70% of all high-speed rail is China. In 1980, 12% of China was forest. Today, it's 24%. They've literally doubled the force. So they, again, this is the planned economy. They know that this is a big problem. And they can actually 
do things from a central control to respond to these problems much better than we can just talking about it and, and never publishing anything at all, uh, uh, never do anything at all about it. Of course, and, and it's not just planning, but uh, they don't have to contend with uh, the profit motive. They, they're not dealing with oil companies and steel companies and auto companies and cement companies who, who want to keep this carbon economy going uh, for their own profits. Uh, in fact, as Greg has pointed out, that's what this war in the Ukraine is about. Also, it's basically the oil companies. <laughs> they want to uh, they want to send natural gas to Europe and stop uh, the gas that's coming from them, uh, Russia. But yes. again, China is able to move on this. I gave you read Xi's uh, report to the twentieth Congress. The whole sections of it devoted to uh, the environment and uh, moving towards a, a green economy. But uh, they have the planning but they also don't have to deal with these uh, capitalists who are opposed to anything that's going to cut into their profits. It becomes an argument for socialism. Yeah. And that's the only way we're going to, unless we get control of these giant oil and gas companies uh, and get away from and uh, ram through uh, green policies, get away from the carbon economy, we're going to die. Right. Uh, and uh, so uh, it, it adds, uh, I, and I'm hopeful that since the environmental movement is so attractive to young people, I'm hoping, uh, I think Marxists ought to be giving more attention to this question of how does the necessity of a transition to a green economy uh, mix in with our uh, need to have a, di a completely different kind of a society, one, not one run by gas and oil monopolies, where, where they have absolute control of a corrupt Congress, uh, but rather uh, a completely different system that can do something about the environmental crisis. I, uh, I'd, I'd like to ask a question about China. Uh, I, I, I've uh, followed it not as closely uh, probably as, as, as Joe and Roger, uh, but I've, it's fascinating, uh, it's, it's development, it's evolution. Uh, there have been some speed bumps, obviously, and, and some have left a kind of bitter taste, uh, the support of China for um, U.S. imperialism during the, uh, the 70s in particular, when the Soviets and the Cubans were aiding the uh, liberation movements in, 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 in Africa. Um, Mozambique, Guinea-Bissau, and Angola, Angola in particular, and the Chinese were sending material aid to the, the imperialists, uh, to the, the people that the U.S. supported. So there have been lots of speed bumps, and uh, this uh, Belt and Road uh, concept I, I'm not clear about. I, I have some doubts about it, but nonetheless, I think the perspective I take is that Generally, in the last decade or so, during the Xi uh, the, uh, administration, his his uh, governance, things have been moving in a, a more positive direction. So, my question is this: To what extent is this uh, a retreat from NEP thinking? That is saying that that NEP time is 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 coming to a close. Uh, we have to change it. And to what extent is it a reaction? to the fact that the United States and Europe have turned against them. I mean, basically the notion, which I think was uh, frankly endorsed by prior Chinese leaders, uh, that, that trade and uh, global exchange can create this peaceful existence and wonderful thing has been shoved back in their face. And they've been forced to really go back to Marxism, Leninism. I mean, that's one of my suspicions. I wonder what the two of you think about that. Well, I, I would just venture to say the it's, it's, I haven't studied this, the, the Xi report, uh, which is very long. Uh, I've just skimmed it and I've skimmed reports about it. Uh, but uh, my one of my takeaways is that they're going to emphasize not uh, growth through exports, but rather growth the gro raising the level of domestic consumption. Uh, and uh, um, so this would, and it, it might actually be both. Uh, it may be that they, 
they're coming to a conclusion that this uh, NEP era or this quasi NEP era that they've been in since 1978 has reached its limits. Uh, and it also may be that uh, the uh, obvious U the US targeting China as the main enemy has given them a kick in the head. And they uh, have concluded that that's, uh, um, that they can never, uh, you know, rely on the U.S. to be a, an honest partner. Uh, so I would, but I'm just speculating. Well, I just 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 elaborate. I mean, one of the, during the '50s and '60s, during Khrushchev's uh, rise, this concept of peaceful peaceful coexistence, which most of us that were Marxist, Leninist, communist at the time, uh, endorsed and believed in, and and it has it had it seemed to have merit. But obviously, uh, the imperialists kicked that notion in the head too. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. it, it wasn't long before all those efforts, and and they were successful to some extent. I mean, there was a, a somewhat of a, 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 a accord, but with Reagan and and the that whole cabal of uh, anti-Soviet virulent anti-Soviets, they never gave up on overthrowing the Soviet Union. They right. never accepted peaceful coexistence. And I'm wondering if a similar phenomenon isn't going on uh, with Xi and, and the Chinese Communist leadership. And, I, and I, I think we're fortunate to have him in the leadership. I think some of the earlier leaders who were more engaged with this courtship would not have responded this way with more socialism, yeah. more, more, more. But, but in any case, uh, I wonder what, Roger, what do you think of this? Yeah, I, you know, what the, the reasons are, I'm not sure, but I think the phenomenon you point to is uh, correct. This is what's happening. Uh, again, you look at the reports of the 20th, Con just read the Wall Street Journal of Barron's on the, on the 20th Congress. They're all in a panic because the, uh, the moderates, those who were pro-market, pro-private industry have been pushed out of the top leadership uh, by, by Xi. Uh, so again, it seems to be a strong indication of putting, again, more emphasis on the socialist economy and more controls on the private economy. Uh, and I, again, maybe you might be right there. They're forced into this because uh, the US has obviously taken a very, uh, since uh, Obama's, remember Obama's pivot towards Asia, this was followed up with uh, Trump's uh, sanctions uh, and, and, and tariffs uh, against China, none of which have been removed by Biden. Biden's just continuing this. Uh, and uh, as this national security strategy points out, uh, he's underscored it even more that, Ch that China's the enemy. And uh, so I think uh, this may, may very well be the reason that China is rethinking this. But I think also, uh, even before this, you could see China was was leaning towards putting more emphasis on the shared prosperity and a, building a modern socialist country by the 100th anniversary of the revolution. Uh, so I think uh, whatever the reasons, uh, I, I agree with the phenomenon. There's more of a stress now on building socialism, strengthening the party than there was uh, a few years ago. You're looking at capitalism. How is it doing with inequity? Not very well. Um, you know, at the height of the Soviet Union, the, the the plant manager made four times what the worker did. In our country, at the same time, it was 150 times what the worker did. Right. Uh, you know, I live in Tacoma. Homelessness is every time I go down the street. There's a new. There's a new homeless camp. That's capitalism for you. Um, and then a little bit of meth and fentanyl added is sprinkled in on top of it. But um, you have people living in modern high rises that are clean and efficient in China that were living in uh, subsistence farms just a few decades ago. Um, and the, the level of education, when I see the war on education, I don't see it at making people enlightened. I see it, the, their, the, the, the rights view of education is to um, have uh, propaganda <laughs> to, uh, you know to have to have them all think the think a certain way i that said i want to say something that that bothers me that i'm not sure how i can put my head around it and that is in order to have this plan community you also have to have a lot of control over what is 
of the communication in the country. So China right now has a problem of young kids playing video games. I have a young grandkid and I, it, he's absolutely addicted to video games. So China has a policy that they just shut off the, they, they shut off the internet for video games at a certain time with certain age limits and that's it. They, they you know, just controlling as you can get. Uh, if they find that certain content on the internet or TikTok or whatever is against what their public policy is, they just censor it. Um, on one end, you can say that's that's repressive, that's Orwellian. On the other way, you could say, well, I, there's a lot of people there and they're trying to solve problems. And that kind of uh, repression ultimately is probably a lot better than having Kim Kardashian be the most popular woman in America. You know, that's a problem to me, uh, if you ask me. Um, let me let me go, go back to one of the things you you raised. First, I, I think it's important to realize, I'm sure I don't have to convince you folks of this, but that ever since this pivot towards Asia, we've been assaulted by this anti-Chinese propaganda. Mm -hmm. It's every day in the news, every day in the paper, everything that you would expect to be a success has turned into uh, a horror show, uh, 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 some kind of villainy. I think a, a good example is this internet thing. Now, I live with two grandchildren, they're upstairs, two boys, uh, 11 and nine. The main problem their parents have, their mother had the main source of conflict is watching these video games. And it's a constant conflict. I hear it every day upstairs, the arguments, the, uh, the tantrums, et cetera. I think that my daughter would be relieved if the state shut off in video games at seven o'clock, frankly. Uh, to me, it, it's a, it would be a big success. I think an, another uh, example of this is uh, COVID, the response to COVID. Uh, the uh, Chinese put forth a uh, mass testing, quarantines, mass vaccines, uh, masking, et cetera. And what were the results? 7,000 people have died of COVID in China. And how many people in the US have died? Over a million died of COVID. But yet you read the papers in this country, it, it, it's a complete failure, it's a villainy, it's tyranny, it's totalitarianism, uh, that people are protesting these quarantines, it's wrecking the economy. Well, uh, frankly, I, I don't see this at all. I think it's a re resounding success. And most people in the world would be happy to have the kind of death statistics that China has are, are around COVID rather than those of the US. You know, right. they're, they're in a modern complex society, there, there is, this, this is illusory, this notion of freedom that you're kind of alluding to. I mean, uh, your, and your, your friend Chomsky was, was, was clear about it in terms of manufacturing consent. I mean, I, I did a quick, I wouldn't call it a survey or a study, it wasn't that serious, but I took a look at what opinion polls were saying about Russia five years ago, and then again in January and February and March and April this year. And it was a complete shift in that time. Even before, even before the war, when there was no you know, immediate justification for vilifying Russia, the, the US had been turning the minds of the people in this country against Russia. And there's no doubt about it. So your choice is, do you want capitalism to have your your grandkids watching perverse, warmongering, you know, insane slaughters in video games dictated by the market and profitability, or would you prefer that you had a government that at least pretended to care about people enough to monitor that and stop it and say, you, we can't continue to let people make money off of these children's minds. You have no other option. There's no idyllic place somewhere in between where we're in a modern society where you know everybody can do whatever they want to do. That's just an illusion. It's an illusion we all were hammered home with when we were kids, but it doesn't exist. Yeah. No. I agree. I agree. We 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 don't have time. I I if you don't mind, I'd like to return to what Roger started with. I think it's so important. 
And I, I really am, am so pleased that he brought it up in the beginning, insisted that we talk about it. But the dangers that are here today are just incredible. And there is no, unfortunately, no real peace movement out there to speak of. Whenever people feel guilty because eight, eight months later, the slaughters are going on, they, they put a Titus all together into other things and they, 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 they protest, but they don't go out in the street and protest. We've got to get people mobilized. This is a very, very dangerous moment, extremely dangerous moment. And, you know, I, 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 I just am so glad that Roger, Roger brought that up and, and we've got to, we got to address it. Well, the, the, to me, the way out seems pretty clear with the Ukraine situation, um, which is to negotiate, you know, negotiate, negotiate. Uh, try to get a feel, you know, the, to legitimately talk about the expansion of NATO, uh, to quit a policy of Putin is bad. We want to get rid of him, regime change, and get somebody in there that we can work with. Uh, that that. Um, the whole issue of the uh, intervention and, and the kind of the fascism that was coming from Ukraine is legitimate and to a certain extent was harming populations that were Russian. These are all, I mean, there, there is an absolute clear way that this could be resolved, but we don't want to do that. We want to get rid of Putin to turn him and turn the whole Russian state into something that can be more controlled for us so now we can have our new boogeyman which is china uh which is fairly uh, effective a, a economy although not sure about it in the future with their population statistics uh, the aging population could put them at, at harm for that and I, did, who 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 are the who are the Democrats that came out and they said that they were the anti-war the 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 the, the squad or whatever and they then immediately fell back and said no we we shouldn't have put that memo out and my aides put it out I didn't believe it and you know which was to have Biden negotiate with Ukraine right I, I, there's literally no peace there's no peace movement at all in this country. Yeah, I, I don't know. And I don't know how to I, I don't know what to say about it. Well, their retreat might not have been as ignominious if there were a peace movement, if they were seeing bodies in the streets with placards denouncing the war. But they're not. Uh, so uh, they're the, it was one of the most uh, humiliating uh, retreats uh, I can remember. Right. Uh, right. And. Uh, um, I got I have friends. I in, in, I have friends in Britain in the peace movement over there, and they were jumping with joy when they heard that the, there was a letter out from 30 Congress members. Yeah. Uh, and then the next day, the retreat. So it, it lasted a total of 24 hours. Right. And, they're all, and, all, and these are the supposedly the best people in Congress. Well, it's just the beginning, though. The, I, to me, I'm, I think it's a positive sign. Of course, it's absolute weak need uh, social democracy caving in here. But nonetheless, it's a sign of how opposition to this war is growing, even within the Democratic Party. It's already there within the Republican Party. It's already there in Europe. So, uh, uh, but I, I, I think to go back to, to Pat's point in a way, in a way, yeah, there, there's a way out of this. There should be a way to out of negotiation of rational people. But I think what we're ignoring here is we're not dealing with rational people in the Biden administration. We're dealing with ideological neocons. There's a very interesting article that Jack Matlock wrote in the Committee on Russia, what's like a US-Russia friendship or whatever recently. Matlock was the ambassador to the Soviet Union. And he writes this article and he said, I warned them at the, uh, at the uh, time of the collapse of the Soviet Union that what we need is national security guarantees for all of the 15 countries that were part of the Soviet Union. And he said, and this did not happen. Instead, they recklessly went ahead and tried to expand to NATO. And this has got us into the, into, the, uh, into the jam that we're in. But he also points out, he says, this is a terrible situation because the Biden administration has made negotiations almost impossible. They're insisting on the Russia's withdrawal from these, including the Donbass, where the Ukraine had killed 7,000 people. They're insisting on uh, uh, 
on uh, Ukraine entering NATO. According to Biden's national security advisor, this is non-negotiable. We're not gonna negotiate with Russia on the Ukraine entering NATO. <laughs> and the third thing, which Biden suggested uh, six weeks ago or so, is that we wanna see Putin overthrown. So, I mean, this Biden administration is terrible. They've, they've put themselves in a place where negotiations is almost impossible. And at the same time, if you read the New Yorker magazine the week before last, Biden is sending more and more advanced uh, weapons to the Ukraine, which again, makes this settlement and negotiation further and further out of reach. This guy is terrible. This Biden, he has to be stopped. He's endangering us all. <laughs> right. And then you haven't you 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 think inflation's bad here? What's going on with inflation in Europe? It's worse. And then the winter coming and the um, oil being restricted. I it it it's going to be going to be bad. And who who's going to walk in and fill the who's going to fill the void? The the peaceniks or the fascists? <laughs> that's that's I I know where I'll put my money on that. So. Um, listen, you two, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate your book, uh, Roger. It was a year ago or so. You were our fourth guest, I think, or one of our first guests. And I knew nothing about uh, the labor union movement in the beginning part of our, our country and the effect of the socialists and the communist party and being instrumental with that. I knew nothing about uh, the Soviet Union until I read your book. You, you two are both educating not only me, but an awful lot of people. And I'm so glad that with the death of Gorbachev, how uh, more and more your names are popping up and um, people are giving you credit for it. Uh, the, new, the new book, like I said, by Carlos um, Martinez. I forget what it's, The End of the World or something. I forget the name of the book. Beginning of, begin, the End of the Beginning. The end of the beginning. The end of the beginning. I I downloaded it yesterday on Kindle, and I'm almost done with it. It's just there's so much um, uh, support for the work and the foundational work that you two did in building on this. There's another a Jeffrey. Uh, there's another another not Jeffrey Sachs. There's another historian that's also I've been watching on podcasts. It's giving you credit for this. Somers, so, Jeffrey Somers. Jeffrey Somers. Jeffrey Somers. Highly, highly um, supportive of you. He has a, a new article in um, Counterpunch and and speaks highly of um, again the foundational <laughs> the foundational knowledge that you two uh, put forth with this this book. So uh, I highly recommend it. I have an extra copy. I'll give anybody that. Uh, <laughs> that w wants to email me since I bought two of them and Greg doesn't need it. I'll be uh, for the, for media rate. I'll send that to a friend. If you just send me an email. Oh, and uh, Pat, I, I want to thank you for those uh, plaudits. And uh, I want to say it reminds me of uh, when Jack Benny was uh, uh, 70 years old, he was given this uh, award and all of these uh, praises for his uh, work as a comedian and actor, et cetera. He got up to accept the award and he said, uh, thank you, he said, but I really don't deserve it. He said, but I have arthritis and I don't deserve that either. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's uh, how I feel about your plaudits. Thank you, uh, we don't deserve it, but uh, I have well, arthritis, I don't deserve that either. <laughs> Well, I, I mean, you know, I think this was uh, in Martina's book, he said uh, the quote, uh, the ancient quote, until the lions have their own historians, the history of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. <laughs> and uh, you're making you're making a little dent in that by trying to change the narrative that is just so prominent in our country that needs to uh, needs to have new historians to change that. And you are the new historian. So thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye.